So this is the beginning of a series of people telling stories about their experiences with Paul Solomon, the fellowship, how the fellowship and the teachings of Paul Solomon have changed their lives, our lives. Mm -hmm. And we're beginning first with David Solomon. David Solomon is Paul's adopted son and by um, uh, by definition, he's my son, <laughs> yeah. but he's more like my brother. Yeah. And uh, David was Paul's apprentice, and he came first to Hearthfire Lodge and wanted to know the Christ, mm -hmm. and was determined to know Jesus. And I know he's found Jesus, so he's going to tell you his story. No, oh, thank you, Sharon. Thank you so much. Yeah, and thank you all for coming and taking your precious evenings to come out here and, and listen. It would be nice to get this on, on uh, tape. Um, you think back to the times of Edgar Casey, and you wonder, you know, would they have gotten this on tape? If they could have, would, would they? Even during the days of Paul, you know, we had just cassette tape. We hardly have any video. We have some, but you, know, you think, oh, if we only, if we only. You know, you even think back to the times of Christ, you know, how did the Gospels, how were they written so accurately? You know, like, like obviously someone had to be a scribe taking notes that someone later edited and edited and made it into almost poetic. So uh, we have the same, I think, uh, opportunity with Paul Solomon's work because uh, we don't, you know, not all of us are going to be here in 30 years. and. Who's going to come afterwards? Like Jess Stern came to Edgar Casey and wrote *The Sleeping Prophet*. Who's going to come in 30 years and write something about Paul? And so I think it's important that we record these stories so that a good uh, publisher or editor or writer, you know, who wants to do something with Paul and make a difference, um, the way we, our lives were changed to make a difference. So tonight, you know, this is probably going to take a couple hours because I think, you know, what I. What's funny right now is I'm going through writing a trilogy about near-death experiences, and the basis for the books is my relationship with Paul Solomon as a student. So I don't, the books are not about Paul per se, but I use Paul as a teacher throughout the book, uh, books actually, and I bring him in. And I don't really talk much about the readings because um, the book's about near-death experiences, and I describe Paul's experience as a near-death experience because it was. It literally had the same core dying events that you have in a near-death experience. You have Paul initially um, in his first experience through hypnosis um, where he goes through a tunnel, has, is led by two deceased playmates he you know, had uh, as uh, young friends earlier in his life when he was young goes to a beautiful meadow where he sees a mountain in the distance, beautiful colors like heaven, and a great library. Uh, very few people know that Edgar Casey described the same, nearly the same thing. Um, and Edgar Casey had a near-death experience when he was five years old. He actually drowned in a pond and slipped into a 12-foot hole and drowned and they found him face down and they were able to re revive him. So. Tonight, I want to go through uh, some of my experiences with Paul. I, mean, I think um, it would take three books to write about them all. Um, but I want to start with the last one first. Uh, after Paul died, I'm going to describe some of the dreams I had with Paul after he died. Um, it, sets, it sets a stage for going back to the beginning. So I'm going to read to you, uh, again, John Anthony West are editing um, the first book right now, we're on chapter three. And, uh, but I'm starting with the prologue here in the book, and this is how the book begins. And I'm going to read this so we have it. In 1994, three months after my teacher and friend Paul Solomon died, I had a vivid dream that I, I died and ascended to heaven. I felt I had to be dead because it seemed I had been there a very long time. I must be dead. I'll... But how did I die? I had no memory of the event. I found myself standing side by side with a group of 20 new spirit arrivals. 
in a small vaulted travertine um, stone room. To my right, the entire wall of the building was missing, opening up to a spectacular view of a great gulf that separated us from a grand shining metropolis I can only call the holy city of God. It was made of dozens of overlapping golden domes that glowed like golden halos against a crystalline glacier uh, blue sky sprinkled with stars, galaxies, and nebula. My mind and heart, everything within me, wanted to fly through space across the gulf and uh, across the chasm that seemed only a few miles away, enter the holy city and have all this wisdom and all knowledge bestowed upon me. The pull on my soul was overpowering. The stone building I stood in was simple and unadorned, like a humble mountaintop shrine or sanctuary, but it seemed a way station or portal to the holy city. Those of us standing together were being prepared for our next step in spiritual growth. New light bodies had been created for our new life in spirit. They floated, lined up side by side, just a few feet in front of us. These new light bodies appeared solid to me. I stood facing their backs so I could not see their faces. I don't remember if I knew any of these souls, but I did know that all of us had died back on earth. An unfamiliar voice suddenly commanded all of us to step forward into our respective new light bodies as if we were incorporeal, incorporeal spiritual mist that could easily blend into them. As I stepped forward, laughter erupted. Not that one, silly. The next one. Everybody laughed. I moved into the correct body, and when I did so, I saw my former teacher, Paul Solomon, in the corner of the room. He looked as I remembered him when he died just three months ago. White beard, white hair, big belly. Yes, it was Paul. <laughs> it wasn't like, what are you doing here? It seemed completely natural that my dead friend and teacher should be there. He motioned, follow me, with his finger. Very commanding. Suddenly, we were no longer in the quaint little mountaintop shrine, but we were walking next to each other on an oak leaf covered mountain trail somewhere in the woodland highlands of the Shenandoah Valley. We walked quietly for a short distance before he spoke to me. He said, David, it would be a shame that you should pass into the afterlife before completing your book. Your unique background and experience gives you an ability to put together very abstract ideas. Connect the dots, finish your book, the time is short. The afterlife encounter with Paul ended abruptly. I woke with tears streaming down my face just as the morning sun was rising. Images of the holy city, city filled my mind. What just happened? It seemed as though I had been in heaven for years, but somehow I was still breathing. I could feel the warmth of the tears now cooling on my face. Sunlight bounced off the rafters of the vaulted ceiling of my condominium. I was alive. I was just human again. That was the dream that I had uh, 21 years ago. And after that, Paul came to me four times. Um, and I'll describe that later. But that was how I want to start this. It's kind of an admonition to um, move forward. Going back, we have to go back to 1979. Um, in March 1979, I uh, was just, um, I just left the Air Force as a conscientious objector. And um, of course, I'd studied Edgar Casey most of my teenage years. Um, I didn't know Paul at the time. Uh, we had a little uh, workshop that I went to uh, where we had to draw mandalas at the ARE. I don't know what workshop it was, but I remember drawing mandalas. And the mandala that I drew and that I marked in March 1979 was this mandala. I'm going to hang this up so I can show you. This mandala, if you can get a picture of that, is, uh, you know, you look at the fellowship symbol next to it, how close it was. I knew nothing about the fellowship at the time. Yeah, how similar it is. So, um, it was the beginning of what was I going to do when I, see, when I left the Air Force, I had wanted to become an astronaut. I was a B-52 gunner. My job was to drop nuclear bombs on Russia during World War III, and that's why I became a conscientious objector. So when I, I had a top secret clearance, so when I was terminated from the Air, Air Force contract, you know, I came home and I didn't know what to do with my life. 
So I uh, screamed out to God, got very drunk one night on about two six-packs of beer. Screamed at God at 2 a.m. in the morning, says, what do you want me to do with my life? And I didn't use those words. I cussed at God. Um, what do you want me to do with my life? Now I'm rudderless. I, I, I didn't have any money to go to college. I had no grants. I, so literally the next few days, uh, I went to the ARE and I was looking through the bookstore and I found a book written by Rose Sigma called Ether Technology. And in the back of the book, there was a reading done by Paul Solomon about how the uh, pyramid builders moved stones and how they were to lift these you know, multi-ton stones with uh, particular technology that UFOs use. And you know, that was all cool and all, all whatnot, but what was cooler was this, this guy lived in Virginia Beach and he wasn't dead, like Casey. So I said, oh my God, I gotta find this guy. And I'm down on 67th Street at the ARE reading this book and I, I gotta find this guy. And I asked the clerk there, where is this Paul Solomon? Well, he's got a little ashram on 37th Street. So literally in 10 minutes, five minutes, I was there knocking on the door and uh, uh, you know, back then it was an ashram, so um, it wasn't that day that Steve Truax answered the door, but I believe it was the next day that I came. Steve Truax was there and said, David, um, how would you like help research the readings? Indec we're indexing the readings right now, and there was these old computer cards with st holes on the edges, you know, for indexing. We used those not for computers, just for typing on, because you know, there were no computers back then. So that's what I started doing, and that was uh, probably, I did the mandala in, in March, so I would say late April or early May that I knocked on the door. I met you that day. Did you? Mm-hmm. Mm. And Paul immediately sent you on a trip. That's looking for yeah, one, yeah, well, the, yeah. That, that records, so we'd have to uh, pass that around. We can, yeah. we can keep speaking now. to this. But it won't matter as far as hearing the, the question. It, it, her question. Uh, I met you that day, David, mm -hmm. at the ashram. And uh, Paul Solomon had already, I guess you met him. I hadn't met him yet. I didn't so meet him until June. He had you on a wild goose chase looking for Bell's Naphtha. Naphtha. Yeah. And I don't know why, but I, that was like 1978. Mm -hmm. I didn't meet Paul until 79. Well, it was 1979. Yeah. So good. That's yeah. I don't. I think it probably when, when happened. Oh, yeah. It probably happened in June, um, um, because I, you know, everybody remembers me lying down on the floor, being this young man with long, bushy blonde hair, tan. You know, I was beach beach bum. Years old. You know, crew cut. You know, that was just growing out from the Air Force. Skinny. Skinny, very skinny. I was lucky if I was 150 pounds. I was like uh, Miles over there. He's a little chunkier actually than I was. Uh, and, ten years, and ten years older. And ten years, yeah, ten years older. I was 20. So anyway, I, I spent hours listening to Paul's tapes, just hours. Just couldn't get enough. Uh, hearing the readings and hearing, you know, more readings than lectures actually, almost all readings and uh, indexing the tapes and then finally they had a uh, a workshop at the ashram and Paul came down and I met Paul. My mom and my dad came at that meeting, a little class, it was just an evening class and uh, I heard that Paul Solomon ordains ministers. So I thought how cool, I mean Paul and I you know, met and it was, I was just one of many other kids running around there at the time, nothing really happened, I thought, well, my mind starts thinking, and I do this, I've done this my whole life, I'm thinking, well, I wrote Paul a letter, you know, about how I wanted to become a minister, I had thought about it as a teenager, I wanted to become a scientist, wanted to become an astronaut, maybe become a minister, but I wasn't ready, but now... I had nothing else I could do, might as well become a minister, right? I couldn't, I'm out of the Air Force and I can never be an astronaut, what can I do? So I didn't have the money to go to school. So I wrote Paul a long, soppy letter, about three pages, about my life and 
my love for God and love for Jesus and my dreams. I had actually written an interpretation of the book of Revelation according to Edgar Cayce's philosophy. And um, I made sure that letter would arrive in time for the Spirit of Fellowship Conference in August 1979. It was at the end of August, so I thought, I'm going to make sure that letter arrives, and guess what? I'm going to drive up there and make sure that he reads that letter. Uh, or at least I'm there when he reads the letter, and hopefully he'll want to talk to me, see me, because there were a bunch of people back then. You know, we had the uh, Carmel in the Valley going on at the time. We had 150 gardeners from um, the uh, gardening school there. Um, so there were a lot of people. I was just one of a couple hundred people running around there. I mean, who would notice me? So. May I interject? Yeah. My daughter Leo was two years old at that time, and she often was in a little stroller with me. Right. And she would point at you and Paul, not just Paul, but you, uh. alone even, and she would go, who, that, who is that light, Mommy? Uh. Who is that that's the first I've heard of that. Oh, that's and nice. I don't think I ever told you that. Mm. So I just wanted you to know that before I forget it. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Susan. That's very nice. You're talking about the the uh, fellowship conference. Yeah, called spirit of fellowship. French spirit of friendship. Right. There were like five hundred people. Yeah, there were a lot of people there. Six hundred people were there. But Mr. Fuller was there. Yeah, Elizabeth Hoover Ross. Yeah. Was there. yeah. Uh, Sir George Trevelyan. It was one of the largest oh, metaphysical conference of its day at the time. So, um, so I had a dream before I went up to the ballet that I was in an auditorium and Paul was on stage with Stephen and he was speaking and my mother was sitting next to me in the audience and all of a sudden an angel walked down the aisle, came over, scooted, scooted, scooted and sat next to my mom and me and she asked my mother if it was okay that I became a student of Paul's. Get, she was get, had to get my mother's permission so that I could be a student of Paul's, and my mother said yes. Yeah, so that was really interesting. So when I ended up going up to the Shenandoah Valley with knowing that Paul would have that letter in hand, I was sitting beside the pool outside, you know, up there they had two locations. They had Hearthfire Lodge, and then they have the big location where the 1,500 acres, 1,600 acres were with the gardening school. and. So I was out there by the pool, you know, wondering if Paul had read my letter, and all of a sudden Stephen Haslam pops up in front of me and says, you're David, you're, well, back then my name was Dwayne Early before I changed my name. Right. Dwayne Morris Early. They used to call me Morris the Cat. <laughs> Dwayne the Bathtub, I'm drowning. That's a nice name. <laughs> that a nice brain, yeah, some good actors named after Dwayne now. Good football players. Um, so Stephen said, uh, Paul would like to see you. So. I said, okay. So I waited, waited, waited. Literally, at the end of the day, I thought nothing was going to happen. Paul finally calls me into his office and said, um, I read your letter. You want to become a minister? Okay. Um, first, you need to, what you need to do is write a book. That's your, that's, those are your credentials. That's the first thing he said. And he also said, oh, you're a revelation scholar, eh? Well, we're going to put you to work. So... Um, I, he said, um, "Are you? What are you doing?" You know, I told him my Air Force story and where I was, and didn't have anything to do, didn't know where I was going. So he said, uh, "Would you like to come back up to the valley?" I said, "Well, I've got to sell my Fiat X19, my brand new Fiat X19." Um, so uh, I said, "If I do that, then I can come up here, and I will stay here. I'd like to be a part of your group." And so I did just that. I went back to Virginia Beach and uh, sold my car. Um, got a ride up to the valley and um, literally all of a sudden I'm at Hearthfire Lodge and I'm staying there. Other students were asking, what's going on? Well, who's this Dwayne kid? You know, who is he? And, and so Stephen was kind of mentoring me. He was I looked up to Stephen. Stephen was like the perfect person in my world. Um, Sharon was there. Um, uh, Paul Edward. I don't think Paul Edward was there. Yes, he was. Paul Edward was there with Grace and their kids. 
or they were young. I think they were, I don't know if they were born yet, but they were coming. Some were coming. They were all born? So, um, so I took up residence down the hall and uh, with Paul, uh, and I didn't know what was going on. I was willing to do whatever. I mean, I basically, I had $1,400 uh, profit from my car after I paid off the loan. I ended up writing Daniel Manuel a check. I'm just, I'm being like the apostles. I'm giving all my money away and I'm following Jesus. Did he tell you first assignment? What was it? Remind me. Oh, cleaning spiders off the back porch. We had a screw, we had a back porch, you know, at Hearth. I didn't like spiders. I had a couple small fears in my life. One was spy. I did not like spiders, and he had me crawling up on a ladder, cleaning off the spider webs. I don't like spiders. Bees and spiders. I don't mind snakes, but bees and spiders, I just didn't like. Did you squish them? I don't remember. I I just know I cleaned them off with a broom and. There was a lot of them. So um, um, I had no clue what it was like to be a student of a teacher. I, I, was, I was a kid. Um, you know, you, you study things in Western culture, but you don't know what it's like to be a student. I mean, never been to martial arts school. You know, you study the Edgar Casey Foundation. You study readings. You read books. You write your dreams down. But you have no clue what it's like to be a student of a teacher. You have no, you know, you learn the lesser mysteries, as Paul called them, in, in books. You learn those lesser mysteries, but the greater mysteries, typically you learn under a teacher. Or you learn from the school, the unit school, you know, planetary mystery school, as Paul called it. I call it Earth University. <laughs> um, and your, your teachers are your wives, ex-wives, <laughs> friends, family members, ex-wives. <laughs> So, you know, I, I, um, and I have this preface so you can see what's happening. And as I, uh, and before I knew it, Stephen was saying, "Hey, would you like to go to Australia with Paul?" Literally, he said, "Well, we got to go get your passport. We're leaving in like a week." So we had to run, stand in line. That's the only way to get a passport in one day. And I had to get my birth certificate from Nevada, California, because I didn't have the stamped you know, race stamped original. So we had to rush to get that, get that back, go to DC, get the passport. Everything in my life since that time has been on time, just enough time to get things done. I don't know if I ever witnessed periods where we just had all the time in the world. Everything, even packing for trips. And it's like, why do we cut this so close? Why are we racing to the airport? I mean, I'm packing things even beforehand, not thinking I'm having plenty of time to pack, and boom, we were just enough time to get to the airport. We're racing, and Paul used to have a yellow pacer. You remember the pacers? They were wide-bodied. That yellow pacer went everywhere, and Paul drove fast. <laughs> you know, there was a highway. You know, there's the long way around through Highway 66, and then there's the short way, which goes over the mountains, and you're going like this. You know, through we getting back to Dulles Airport, and God knows how many times I went to Dulles Airport. Um, so I'm in Australia, and um, you know we you know we didn't go for short periods of time. We went for months at a time, three months at a time. You know, it wasn't just a short trip. And uh, you know, I was Paul's shadow. You know, he was teaching me. Not the lesser mysteries you find in books, the greater mysteries. And the greater mysteries you don't learn in books, you learn by doing. Service being one of them, learning to serve a teacher for the purpose of learning to serve others. You know, so, you know, he always said, you know, you're not serving me so that you can serve me. I can take care of myself. In fact, I learned subsequently, you know, even considering taking on a student is a pain in the ass. No, really. You have a huge amount of responsibility caring for that person, making sure they learn or watching their... It takes a lot of love to care for a student. Um, I don't think he did it because he wanted his pipes filled or his coffee thermos filled. He did it so that I would learn service, you know, open doors for others. And I could see that in almost all of Paul's students. If, 
you know, I look at it, you know, the, the old guard, as I call them, um, have, have a particular quality about them. Those who spent time with Paul, um, not to make it better than, you know, others, but they, they all seem to carry a particular quality because they spent so much time around him. Um, serving and doing and listening and, and meditating and talking and chatting about lessons and life and whatnot. So, so I'm in Australia learning to serve and a couple experiences stood out. One is Paul like, loved to dive. He was a diver. And so um, we went to the Great Barrier Reef, being Australia is one of the biggest reefs in the world. And uh, we were diving off the coast, and we were in a 50-foot sailboat. And I don't know who we rented it from or whose it was. But before I ever got in the water, I got so seasick. We had a storm come through, and we were up and down. And I, I mean, I had no clue that I had any problems with water motion sickness. But I, I got so terribly ill, I just wanted to die. I didn't realize being seasick was that bad. All I wanted to do was sleep to get through it. Paul seemed just fine, and I was the one sleeping. So finally the storm let up, and we were anchored off the coast of this island on the Great Barrier Reef, and we noticed there was a lighthouse at the top of the, of the uh, island. So we took a little boat to the shore, and uh, uh, we'll take a walk up to the top of the island. So we're walking up. You know, this is a tropical place. There are fruits, tropical fruits hanging from the tree, and we're just like enjoying the scenery. And on the way up to the top, we're talking about, you know, past lives. You know, I was always interested in reincarnation. I'm going to talk a little bit about that this Sunday at, the, at our sun, you know, adult Bible class we're going to have before service. And um, so we're talking about reincarnation, and, and, I, and I brought up the subject. I wonder. You know, who, one of us would have been King Henry VIII. And I don't remember how the subject came up on the way up, but it did. And Paul never, you know, denied or claimed that he was King Henry VIII. So, you know, I remember that. So we were walking to the top of the, of the, of the island, and there was a little quaint house there at the top. Knocked on the door, and there was somebody home family that guarded the white the lighthouse was there they took care of it but you know it said we're just you know Americans trudging around you know and they said come in come in you know let's have lunch it's lunchtime so they invited us to the table there and uh, you know they started asking Paul what do you do I'm doing classes and traveling around the cities and and then somehow the concept the talk about reincarnation came up and one of the uh, family members said, you know, wouldn't it be funny if King Henry VIII were sitting here at the table with us right now? Oh. And Paul and I looked at each other and said, oh my God. There are rumors that apparently Paul was King Henry VIII. Um, can't confirm or deny that either, but that's pretty strange. That's pretty good confirmation that maybe... He told other people. Oh, he did? No. So... Um, that was a really interesting event, and I'd really, my ears really perked up to that. So, um, another event happened. A couple other events happened in Australia. One is, uh, you know, we went to one restaurant. I remember one restaurant. Paul loved food, and we went to this restaurant where there was just all-you-can-eat buffet. And I remember my eyes went wide open. There literally was more food than I've ever seen in my life. You know, every, you know ham and chicken and roast beef, and I mean, I've ne still to this day I've never seen that much food in a place. And, you know, forevermore it became the place with wall-to-wall -wall food. And um, I could eat as much as I want. I would never gain weight. It was just ridiculous back then. It's not that way today, you know. But, um, Paul, you know, I always was running around doing the things to help Paul get through these workshops. I didn't learn anything about what Paul was talking about in inner light consciousness. I certainly heard some of the lectures, but I was so busy doing stuff, I hardly had a chance to meet people. I was always running around doing things. Um, you didn't take IOC? I did eventually, but sort of. <laughs> uh, by osmosis, you know, by hearing it 50 times, but not really sitting through a whole class, you know, like some of the others did through advanced ILC 
and whatnot. I mean, he never would let me teach at all. It was, I was always to, to follow and learn. I remember one particular time where we're you know, walking through some of the forests in Australia and I started walking in front of him. Boy, did that get him. He was upset. He said, you never walk in front of your teacher, ever. And I said, okay. You know, I just didn't think about it. Just think, just da da da, walking through the forest. You know, it was a small trail. And I, but, you know, it, it was kind of a, it, 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 the importance was always being conscious to, of respect. And I didn't. I had no clue. I mean, I, as I learned later on, you know, in the years coming, you know, I grew up in a, you know, kind of a, a low-income, you know, family. We didn't have much. And I wasn't really taught the finer points of dealing with people, actually, communicating and whatnot. Um, one cool event happened in um, leaving Australia for New Zealand on our way back home through Hawaii was um, we were sitting on the plane, getting ready to take off, and I'm going through the checklist in my mind. Got this, got this, got this, got this. Suit bag. Suit bag? Where's the suit bag? Oh, God. As I'm taking off, I remembered that I left a suit bag on the back on the back side of the hotel door, you know, just hanging up on the hangar. And we're taking off for New Zealand. I mean, can't ask the pilot to turn the plane around. So I kind of sheepishly told Paul, you know, because he got lectures coming up in New Zealand. Oh, God, I said, I left the suit bag. <sighs> he actually was pretty calm about it. I could see he was perturbed. So, well, I guess when we land, I'll call the hotel and see if it's still there. So we land, and I'm worrying about it, sweating about it, the whole three, four, five-hour flight that it was to New Zealand, and got landed, and found the suit bag, put it on the next plane, got it out there. So we had about three weeks in Christchurch, New Zealand, in which, by the way, New Zealand is one of the most beautiful, purest countries you've ever seen. They don't have any garbage on the streets. There's no trash, at least back then. In 1979, there wasn't. Um, so we head back towards Hawaii. We land at the airport. Paul wants to take a, you know, you know, if you're gonna stop through Hawaii, you got to go diving. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Paul told me about an experience he had. We were off uh, one of the islands of Lanai, and I don't even know if he told you this, Sharon. Um, he remembered being sacrificed off a cliff as, uh, from uh, being a kahuna. That he was thrown off the cliff into the waters below where we were diving. Um, and he could remember it clearly. Um, he was, yeah, I think he was a young man. He was not very old. But he remembered that and he told me about that story. And, um, so that was cool. Um, we left Hawaii, and um, uh, actually we were traveling in between interflight inter uh, travel um, airplanes between the islands. And we get our, on a plane, and we're traveling to another island, and I think, oh, checklist, got this, this, this suit bag. Oh, where's the suit bag? I left the suit bag in the airport <laughs> where travelers sit and wait for planes. I left it there. Because, you know, we didn't check it through. We were going to do a carry-on luggage. <sighs> Paul. Well, I, was, and that was even worse because this was out in the open. Someone could have stolen the whole bag. Those were like $1,000 worth of suits there, probably more. So we land, and I'm sweating the whole time. Land, and you know, they, they found the suit bag. Someone had turned it in. Those were the good old days when people did that, I guess. So, or the bomb squad didn't come out because... Oh, should, should we tell some of the other stories of other people leaving things? Oh, I bet. I, I mean, I'll tell you my maybe I should go tell ahead. story without sure. hearing English. Yeah, what, sit next to me, Sharon, yeah. so that <laughs> it can <laughs> record it. Can we get her a chair? Get her a chair. Um, she was traveling back then. Um, I think. We were in England, and Paul had a lecture in Lincolnshire about oh. a thousand people. And um, um, that was um, uh, John Christian and myself and um, that young man that just died. Mm -hmm. And 
I was responsible for packing his things for his lecture because he was going up in his dungarees. And so instead of packing Paul's clothes, oh. <laughs> I packed Jeff's clothes. Oh, dear Lord. And he, so he Wind had to get... Winboard? Winboard, John Winboard. Aaron, right. yeah, John, John Aaron, Winboard. Uh, John Winboard. So <laughs> Paul gets up in front of a thousand people. I want to introduce you to my fiance. She packed my clothes, and that's why I'm wearing <laughs> these. <Yeah. laughs> she packed the wrong. <laughs> yeah, I, you know there, you know there were several times that I know Mark Davidson one time he left right. left his medicine, right. you know his insulin, which he depended on, you know, to not have you know an insulin, you know, a, a, a diabetes I mean, attack to India. in India, you know, <laughs> you know, so I've he's had to bear the great. brunt of. <laughs> You know. And then it was the time of uh, Rick Fag took his passport. <laughs> yes, took his passport. He had no way to get through customs. That's right. <laughs> he, he was in England. He was going to Belgium to do a class. Right. And um, he gets arrived in Belgium. Then he realizes he has no passport. And That's right. his assistant was going over by ship. And he took the pa his passport. So Paul said he hypnotized the guy. <laughs> <in> the <airport. laughs> <laughs> That's right. Speaking of hypnosis, Paul used to go to the dentist and not ever take Novocaine. He would hypnotize himself to not feel pain. I could never do that. Yeah, I, I, I don't like dentists to begin with, but yeah, every time he went to the dentist, he wouldn't, he wouldn't take pain medicine or get a shot, even a shot of Novocaine. He would just hypnotize himself and go through it. Um, you know, I'm kind of sequentially going through my mind. I have um, um, notes that I've taken to point out uh, different things that happened. Let me go through my notes here. So, you know, by, I spent about a year with Paul um, doing everything I could to learn. And uh, by 1980, it was September 1980, Paul said, it's time for you to go to New York City, and uh, I'm going to send you with Andrew, uh, Billy, called Billy, Andrew Schaefer, you know, we all knew him as Billy, and um, we were sent us like a tag team together. Uh, we had $400 in our pocket, we took a train, you know, up to, up to New York City, and we carried these two luggage, you know, they didn't have rollers back then, and I had to drag these, you know, 100 pound each luggage. You know what it's like to try to walk through New York City? You, do, you walk about 50 feet and you go, oh, oh, God. And you walk by another 50 feet and you've got to walk 10, 15 blocks or wherever it was. And I got to uh, stay initially on 73rd Street with the, uh, with the Levins, uh, Dr. Susan Warren Levin, who ran a medical clinic up in the World Trade Center, the two towers. And... Um, you know, when I first got up there, you know, I got off at the wrong stop and I ended up in Harlem. And I got off and I walked up on top and all I saw was black people. I'm going, and some guy said, uh, Mister, you better turn around and get back on that train. And, you know, I had never been to New York City, so I got back on the train, you know, went back down to 73rd Street and again did my painful walk with the luggage. Um, so, you know, Paul, the point that Paul sent. Andrew, Billy, and I up to New York um, was to learn from Da Liu, the Chinese teacher um, of, of Tai Chi. Uh, he was one of two Tai Chi masters that came to the United States from Taiwan in 1928. Um, he was considered, you know, by far one of the greatest masters of Tai Chi in the world. Um, and Paul wanted me to study with him, along with Andrew. <coughs> Um, you know, Paul was, you see, you could tell by the, what, what he was doing, he wasn't trying to keep me for himself. He wanted me to have as much exposure to different teachings as possible. So we not only were going to study from Dalu, we, um, we had a reg whole regimen of <coughs> learning memory techniques from Harry Lorraine, learning speed reading, learning journalism. English, typing. In fact, that's where I learned to type. I went to the Berkeley Claremont Business School and learned to type. I was in a class of 50 women. <laughs> you need some water? That's okay. 
Okay. Okay. Um, I actually fell in love with one of the girls up there. You know, me and girls. Um, Paul convinced me, because Paul used to come up about every three weeks and visit us while I was up there. And because um, he would do classes at the, um, you know, on inner light consciousness or healing classes up at Terrytown, which is just north of New York City. He would check on us and Paul commanded me I had to write journals. That's you know, this, like this. I mean, this, this is just one of the journals I've had during the last year to keep copious journal notes. And I have boxes full of my seven terrace color journal notes. And I was just learning to type, and so my terrible typing, you can see all, you know, back then they had correction tape. And when I didn't have correction tape, line, 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 line. Um, but it was, it was important, uh, the journal keeping, and thank God I could not have written these books without those journals, because I went back to the journals to see what did I dream, what did I do, what, what dates things happened, what was I thinking, and looking at the lessons, because the whole point of the books is about, you know, we all are kind of building for a life review, and you might as well get it on journal now and take care of it now, so you're not shocked when you die. Oh, I didn't handle that. And, oh, I was unconscious of that and whatnot. You know, Paul was trying to teach how to be conscious of your surroundings. You know, remember, you know, in Kung Fu, when Master Po was talking to uh, Kwai Chang, and he said, uh, what do you hear, or what do you see? And so Kwai Chang says, well, I hear the birds, and I hear, you know, I see the water flowing, whatnot, and uh, Master Po then says, well, how do you not see the grasshopper sitting on your foot? And uh, that's what Paul was all about, is noticing what was going on around you. In fact, we would sit um, in meetings he'd have with some friends. It's mostly going out to dinner. Oh, we had gorgeous dinners. Paul would always have me try to listen to two or three conversations at once. I said, how can you do that? How can, if I focus on one person, those just go away. And, and it was a difficult task. I mean, I, I would sit there and try, you know, and hear what they're saying, hear what they're saying, you know, what's going on. And so, and be aware of what's in your room, what's, what's on the ceiling, what pictures are on the wall, and being aware, so you, should, you should be able to go into a room and know within seconds, close your eyes and be aware of what's on the walls. And so that was part of the training. Um, Paul didn't sit around and talk about spiritual truths with me. Everybody else got to hear it. I'd ask Paul about a dream. What does dream mean? He would never answer me about what a dream meant. Never. Not once. I don't remember him once ever telling me what a dream meant. Um, and I was really into dreams. I mean, I re record a lot of dreams. And nope, I can answer it. You're going to learn it yourself. So I'm in New York. I'm learning. I'm doing all of these disciplines. Andrew and I are getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning. We're doing... Each, we're doing I Ching, we're throwing I Ching, we're doing medit ILC meditation, we're praying, we're doing the scrolls. We had the, uh, the what we call the garden scroll. And uh, we were reading that every morning, noon, and reading it out loud at night. In fact, we used to stick our heads out the window and yell the scroll. <laughs> Today I begin a new life. All great men of God, yada, yada, yada. And we'd read that thing and yell it out the window. But, you know, those scrolls, you know, he ended up um, writing the, rewriting the scrolls later on. Those were one of the most influential, important things he ever had us do. Because you end up memorizing them. It's three pages long. And you end up memorizing them, memorizing them after 40 days. You read them for 40 days and then you go on to the next scroll. Um, it was very important. I mean, Sharon, if you remember those days? Oh, man, God, 40 days in the wilderness. 40 days in the wilderness. That's right. 40 days in the wilderness. Yeah. I will persist until I succeed, and so on. We had, I greet this day with a commitment to love. And I say that every morning before I get out of bed. What's that? That's what I say every, every morning. morning. I greet this day it with a commitment. It comes into my head. I'm right. I'm to remember so, you know, when we're talking about experiences with Paul, we're not always talking about supernatural experiences. We're talking about the way he taught, the way I responded. Um, 
New York was an interesting experience. I think of all the things that Paul ever had me do, that was the most intense. You know, meeting Dalu. You know, I ended up cleaning Dalu's uh, house. He, you know, you would think a Taoist was like a Zen Buddhist, where they keep their house impeccably clean. Well, a Taoist doesn't do that. He was a mess. He had money everywhere. There was just stuff everywhere. But you know, to pay for Tai Chi classes, I ended up. He hired me to clean his apartment. And it became a little bit like the Karate Kid, wax on, wax off. <laughs> um, you know, how to water, not too much water, too little water. So, you know, another aspect um, of teaching you know, happened. I, I ended up calling all of my teachers rice paper teachers. Like, you know, Kwai Chang had to, what well, qualifies as a rice paper teacher is when you walk across rice paper and you don't tear it, you're qualified to be a rice paper teacher. And so, you know, Paul was my first rice paper teacher, and then Dalu ended up being my second rice paper teacher. So, um, there were a lot of experiences in New York. The one that really stood out, um, there's so many things that happened between Andrew and I, for instance, but again, that's, I want to stay focused on Paul. The one experience that really was cool is when I was in New York, and some of you that heard me speak in a service about this particular story where I, I was bored one day in my apartment and I walked down the street just to get some air and I just felt good. I was walking around and you know, New York's full of about eight million uptight people. No one's smiling, right? They're all serious, they're all going somewhere. And nine million now. So I'm walking from 110th down to about 92nd and I figured I'd walk far enough and I started to turn around and walk across the street to go back north. And I saw this black lady leaning, leaning against the brick building next to a fruit and vegetable stand and I, I thought, you know, she was sniffling, she had a, and um, I smiled at her, I just gave her a big grin and I walked to the sidewalk and she was about from, probably about here to where that wall is and all of a sudden I was on the sidewalk and I'm looking at her and she's smiling at me and she starts nodding her head like this and all of a sudden this bolt of electricity just hit me and knocked me down to my knees and I started bawling. I didn't even know what happened. It was like, what the heck just happened? I mean, like, what's going on? What, what, I'm feeling this holy presence, just boom. And she's just looking at me and watching me cry and I'm, and I was actually scared and, and crying at the same time because I didn't know what was going on. So I started walking a little bit and I'm looking at her and she comes out and faces me and I'm looking at her and I'm going, I, I was afraid to go up to her and say, who are you? Is it one of the angels, you know, be careful for the strangers you meet lest you come upon an angel of an unaware. I was, it, it scared me, nothing like that had ever happened to me. So I, uh, I go back actually, I you know, kind of lasted for about 30 seconds to a minute, shh. So I walked back to the apartment. Anyway, Paul came back <laughs> in about a week and I told him about what happened. I said, who, what happened, Paul? Who was that? I said, was that like an angel? He said, no, that was Jesus Christ. Yeah. You know, when you've had that presence hit you so hard, um, you know who it is. And, you know, I've had that relationship with Jesus since I was young. I mean, he'd come to me in dreams and whatnot, but... Um, it happened to me years later, and I'll talk about that, but it, you recognize that presence when it hits. Um, so, you know, New York was like that. It was just constant back and forth. It, was, it seemed like it lasted eternity, yet it was only a year and a half. So, when... Yes, take a break. All right. You have some food. Okay. Yeah, take a break. Take a break. So, um, finally, you know, uh, there was a point where I had spent so much time doing Tai Chi. I mean, I did it everywhere, on the subway trains, on the sidewalk, you know, everywhere I went, bus stops. People thought I was on drugs, doing Tai Chi constantly, you know, the slow moving thing. But I lived it, breathed it, thought it. 
And it came to a point where Paul thought I'd finally had, I learned, I really learned Tai Chi, and I had to tell Da Lu that I was leaving. He took it hard. He called Paul, in fact, in his book he wrote Master Paul. Um, but he was not happy with Paul when I told him I was leaving. Because Da Lu wanted me to be his apprentice. Um, he said, just when you're getting good, you're leaving. Uh, and there was a lot more to learn. There really was. Tai Chi sword, push hands, you know, to really become a master at something. Paul's intention wasn't for me to be a master of something. It was to learn it very well, to bring it back so I could teach at Hearthfire you know, to groups that later on would come from Japan. I taught Tai Chi. Um, but I did come back, and I, I know it broke his heart, uh, Dalu's heart. But I came home. Uh, Andrew, both of us came home. And uh, so ne the next stage of our life at Hearthfire uh, was uh, gardening. Paul loved gardening. I mean, he just, like any extra money he had come in, garden. So he just loved planting, and we um, made an eight-petaled lo lotus that had hundreds and hundreds of yellow and gold marigolds. Um, and we lined, you know, this lotus was what, 200 feet across. Yeah, it was huge. And we then lined it with white stone, which was really not smart because, you know, any kind of wind blowing stuff and they get covered up anyway so but it was pretty when it was when it was built uh, we had celosia um, red and orange celosia planted it was beautiful and Paul designed it all and Andrew and I built it um, we had garden beds raised garden beds uh, there must have been 20 on each row that were 150 feet long. I don't know who we were planting for, but we made them. Uh, we used to run the Harrisonburg and get oak leaves. We'd run around town, people put oak leaves out, and we'd go take our truck and we'd get oak leaves because we would churn them up in our uh, grinder and put them on the garden beds to make just beautiful black soil. Alan Chadwick, you know, had taught at Carmel in the Valley, and you taught um, bio biodynamic gardening, French intensive biodynamic gardening, and so Paul took a lot of those gardening principles and applied them in the garden. I actually never got to learn directly from Alan Chadwick. I just missed him. He died in May 1980, and I was already traveling with Paul, and I really never got to hear him. Um, uh, a lot of people that read sort of the fellowship biography were surprised Alan Chadwick was there. He was famous for what he did. Um, but we spent a lot of time gardening. Um, Paul would go out in his robe of colors, walk around the garden. Um, he found a baby bird. Sharon actually sent me a picture of that, where that fell off a nest, and he would walk with the baby bird on his shoulder and talk to the baby bird. And you'd see this prophet walking around the prophet with his baby bird, you know. Um, yeah. You know, Paul loved nature and he loved gardening. Yeah. Go ahead. We used to walk. We used to walk around the, the garden and we would um, take any baby bird that was had fallen. Yeah. And we'd take him back and we brought him into the house. And uh, Paul would feed him with dog food with an eyedropper. Yeah. And then he'd give him a bath and he'd dry him with a hair dryer. <laughs> oh, <that's right. laughs> and David had to clean up the mess with the <laughs> he put him in the bathtub. Yeah. <laughs> David. <laughs> and then one day he decided no more birds in the house. No more birds in the house. Yeah. <laughs> but um, Yeah, I had to clean it up. Yeah, and we had a cat there, Aramie, Nicole's mm. cat. Mm -hmm. And the, the cat would get birds and eat birds. It was a wild cat. But the, when the baby birds used to congregate on the porch, Aramie just let the birds right. chirp. Yep. And they used to come in every day and they would chirp, chirp, chirp when it was time to feed them. 
That's right. And that was my job. I, I fed the birds morning and night, the, twice a day. And I used to, you know, we would let them fly around. And um, and so I would call them baby birds. Baby birds. <laughs> and baby they would bird, come right. and they would land on my head. And they would come in and uh, and one day um, one of, we couldn't. One of the birds flew up in the top of the tree. Right. And. Uh, we kept calling and calling, it wouldn't come down. Baby bird. So baby bird, baby bird. And uh, Paul got Andrew to get a ladder no. <laughs> to go up and get the baby bird. Yeah. He went to call the fire department <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to get the bird to out the tree. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Andrew managed to get the baby bird. <laughs> you know, some of these stories you remember, you, if you say it, it then reminds me, but I just, I'd have to be almost hypnotized to get all these I, I stories know. Well, out. I just, just remember that one. Every once in a while, I'll yeah. butt in. Yeah, just butt in, because I remember all the stories. So we garden and garden and garden. You know, you know when you lift those 200-pound wheelbarrows, you know, you get really muscle-bound. So, um, Let's tell them about your bonsai garden. Oh, the bonsai garden, yeah. You know, well, that, that uh, sets the stage for Felton Jones visiting Hearthfire Lodge in 1982. And, uh, you know, I remember this Oldsmobile coming down the driveway, leaving a dusty trail, and pulled up front, and this tall, lanky, you know, 6.2, 6, six foot four man walks up, and who's that? And uh, so Paul walks out to greet him, and they hug one another, and it was Felton Jones, and, you know, kind of unannounced. Cowboy hat. Cowboy hat and all. Um, and, uh, you know, so, you know, they met for a few minutes, and then before you knew it, you know, back in those days, we didn't have cell phones. They, like, took off in the pacer. <laughs> like, uh, you know, you don't, can't call and say, where are you going? What's going on? Um, so they were gone two or three hours and came back with about uh, a dozen little nursery plants from the Harrisonburg nursery and we were going to do a bonsai class and uh, you know Paul had you know told a story about you know how he met Felton back in 1974 and Paul was Felton's student lived with him you know cleaned his house was ready to give up the fellowship to you know work with Felton but that became the basis for a, you know a story he called the planetary mystery schools and all about you know, Felton and Felton's bonsai master, who, who talked about the story, you know, the mop and bucket and the Japanese, Chinese uh, students who were learning the lessons that God presented them, and those lessons could be taught through a bonsai tree. So we had this bonsai class at Hearthfire, and we're out in the front porch, you know, going through these trees, and we all have to choose our own tree. You know, Paul was sitting there watching, and Everybody was allowed to choose their own tree, so everybody chose a tree, and then it came to me, and there was this azalea. It looked more like a bush, but it looked nice, so I chose the azalea. And uh, we were told to start pruning off old dead limbs and whatnot, and I didn't quite know what to do with it. It looked like a bush, and I didn't know what to prune. And so Felton comes over, and he says, never sit down while you're doing a bonsai, always stand up. And uh, so, he came over and took his pruning shears, bonsai pruning shears, and cut this huge major branch off the front, leaving like... Stop. Did stop. Did you, we can't hear it. Oh. Did you get any of that? In the back. Oh, good. So he cuts off this huge branch, and he turns the tree and says, we're done. I mean, this branch was like a third of the tree. And I, I said, God, there's got to be some spiritual meaning behind this, what's going on. And I said, you know, Paul, I said, what, what happened? And he said, well, he said, apparently the front side of your tree needed pruning. pruning. And I said, well, what's that about? So well, apparently you try to present yourself as, how do you, how do you call it, holy or you know stuff. And he just pruned it off. <laughs> wow. Guess you're going to have to fill it in. So that's what I did. You know, so what I when, when Felton left that class, I ended up building a little bonsai garden in front of you know the hearth fire, and it was about a mound about four feet high, and I would spend time going out with our tr little truck, getting stones, looking for stones to build my little bonsai garden that you know, made it look like trees that were growing in the mountains. Sharon 
sent me a picture of it some time ago. Um, but it was pretty cool. You could see the faces of old men in it, and uh, I have cascading bonsai, and I was really into bonsai. I really, but I really didn't know horticulture, and I used to go to Mount Jackson try to get these trees out of the wild, and you can't just rip a tree out of the wild. They'll die. You know, they have usually these long, gangly roots, and you have to be patient. Sometimes a, a bonsai master will go out in the wood, and they might cut one root. Let that root, you know, they'll put some soil around it, and let that root grow finer roots, and maybe two years later they'll cut another major root. So maybe four or five years they could take that tree out of the ground. Me, I couldn't wait. I took that tree out of the ground. I'm going to make it work, and I killed every tree that I tried. I felt so bad. I felt so guilty about killing those nice, these were older, nice looking trees. So I, um, but I love bonsai. But I had a lot to learn. I had so much to learn, and I wasn't patient. So uh, anyway, garden, you know, stories continue. We ended up in 82 doing the Davidson Affair. And, um, you know, of course, the whole lodge and half the fellowship, all the fellowship, was involved in this, this musical that was um, developed like Jesus Christ Superstar, Paul and Chris Van Cleve. Um, Paul wrote the words. Chris Van Cleve wrote the music. And uh, they worked together. They actually went to Hawaii to compose a lot of the, the songs and write the songs. And they came back with the whole play, the musical. And so we were involved with um, practicing for it. Most of the staff had a part. I played Nathaniel, you know, the scholar, um, which was great. My mother was one of the healed women in the in the play, um, Stephen, you know, Russell Robertson, who's no longer with us, you know, was there, and Paul Edward, who's no longer here, he played a part. Um, I'm Sharon, you were in the play. Yeah, well, Susan, um, Susan wrote down, all, wrote down all the music. Yeah. And scored it. Scored it. Scored it. I mean, oh, yeah. The, the, made it professional. I mean, yeah. for the instrument, each of the, write down the parts for each of the instruments. Right, right. Yeah. And so, so, uh, so that it could be an auction, and I was, I had done something. I messed up, and I got left. I got oh, left behind. I couldn't remember. <laughs> I was in trouble. I, was, <laughs> I don't know who I had a fight with, but I. But then I, I got to come at the last minute. And well, the, I got to see it. Well, the uh, <laughs> play was sold. Had five sold out performances. What there were a thousand people. Yeah. You know, it was yeah. at the Wells Theater in Norfolk, Virginia, and, yeah. and uh, one of the cool things I remember was. Um, after the play one night, a group of uh, Down syndrome kids met us outside and they were crying. Their tears were coming down their face and they're hugging everybody, hugging Paul, and we're crying. And it was really beautiful. And um, it's a shame that that musical has never gone beyond. It went through a reader stage. They traveled around the United States, did a bit, but it still sits waiting. It could be become a major musical again, like like Godspell or Jesus Christ Superstar. It's just waiting for the right investor to get interested. Chris, is, Chris Van Cleve, who played Jesus in Jesus Christ Superstar and traveled the United States, uh, has been you know, seeking uh, investors, but it hasn't gone anywhere yet. But I think it's, it's, it's there. We actually got the tape and the CD mastered, so it's remastered, and it's, you know, it's, it's in perfect condition. Uh, but it's, it's something that should be done someday. I remember the early days when Paul started writing it. Uh, Chris Van Cleve was at Hearth Fire for a synthesis program. It's a month-long program where we um, personal transformation program. To, yep. And um, Paul would type the words of a song, mm -hmm. and he would get Chris, and he would give Chris the words, and Chris would take a few hours or a few days and come back with with music, and uh, Paul would put input into the music, and Chris would put input into the words, and um, it was going on night and day. It was really a, a wonderful time. Well, the play uh, takes place in uh, mm -hmm. you know the fictional future, um, where Jesus comes back as a character, you know, born to uh, Emmanuel, or born to Mar uh, Maria. Maria, and he's, he's, Jose he's, Emmanuel. Jose. 
Jose Emanuel, and he's born in, uh, they all come to New York City, and there's no rooms in New York City, so uh, Jose Emanuel is born in the boiler room of the Waldorf Astoria. Yeah. The yeah. big hotel in, in uh, New York City. And Jose goes throughout New York City gathering, you know, his disciples, and you have a, an auto repair mechanic, and, you know, you have all these cool characters um, coming in to make, uh, and we have the greatest uh, singers and music. I mean, just the songs, when we play these songs, even when we do the ordination ceremonies, so the songs that we do, the song that we do for the ordination ceremony so comes from the Davidson Affair. And that happened, uh, Paul wrote the words, and the next, uh, Chris was in at Hearthfire. Right. It's about four and a half hours away, and we were all going to leave early in the morning for an ordination the next day, right. and the night before, Paul gave Chris the words, and by the next morning, Chris had the music. And it's and one it of the most beautiful the songs. Yeah, it yeah. is. It's so you know, so send I you. So send I you. Yeah. Yeah. So send I you. And Based on Jesus um, instructions to the apostles. So, so, so send I you to do what I have done before. You know, to fields that are white with harvest. Commissioning the Never apostles to go out. Never was the need so great. The workers, workers so, so few. few. Yeah. Yeah. And send you. So send I. So send I you. It was a great experience to go through that. Yeah. It was, you know, that's how you learn. You know, all these things are not necessarily book learning. You go through the experience of playing in the play and, and the musical, and you just gain. It's such a memory you don't forget. And 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 it was amazing because people came to finance it. That yeah. Nicole Dupont Nicole, was well, one. She yeah. might not want her name on a tape that goes out, yeah. so yeah. we'll put okay. the name out. But this generous, beautiful person came and gave yeah. the money to produce it. Produce it. It was, it was uh, not cheap to produce, and so the same thing applies today. You have, you know, we've got to find an investor to do that. Um, after the Davidson affair, um, you know, what we would do for classes, we would have occasional classes at Hearthfire Paul, would, you know, we'd have a talk and record it. I, I did a lot of the recording on Real to Real. Uh, we had the gift shop down the road where we'd have some classes. They had a wood floor. We'd have Tai Chi there and we'd do classes. You know, we mostly paid for our mortgage by having uh, retreat programs and 30-day you know, retreat programs. People would come from all over the world. And we don't do much of that anymore. And it would be something, you know, bridging continents is what a, a word we used to use. Uh, we have very little of that and we'd like to reawaken that again. And the way the way it happened before, the way we bridged continents was to send teachers out to Europe, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa. Susie Holbeach, of course, from South Africa, uh, she recently passed away in March. Um, and um, so, yeah, that's something that we'd like to see to, you know, go out again. It was taken for granted. We had, uh, later on, we had uh, groups of 30, 40 Japanese come over and stay at Hearthfire Lodge. Um, synthesis programs that were 30 days and so on. I mean, we really were an international fellowship, a fellowship of the Inner Light International. We produced newsletters every month. I worked with Murr and helped uh, write some articles and publish. You know, the old days, the way you laid out newsletters, you got printouts from the printer of um, the print that you had to use glue, hot glue, and place on a backlit uh, a screen and you would cut and paste, cut and paste, cut and paste. That's the way things were done back then. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I wish, and, and we have a lot of those newsletters in stock and Still. Len and I have them, we have them upstairs here. You know, that's another project we need to put those in and uh, covers that protect them and because there's a lot of information in those newsletters, a lot of, a lot of lectures that were written and printed there. Um, 1984 came around. That was the uh, year Paul had a near-death experience. And on March 4th, and I went back and checked, it's March 4th, 1984, he died. March 1994. Four. I know, but he had his near-death experience. Near experience. In oh, March 4th, 1984? That's correct. Really? Really. Near Ten years to the date that he died. Okay. Was it March 5th or March, March 4th? 5th. So he went into the hospital March 4th. No, he was at he, no, no, no. He he went to the Harrisonburg. You're talking about 
Oh, the near death. The near death experience, where he died on the operation table. So, Paul had been feeling ill for many days. Uh, he ate a bowl of chili. <laughs> He did what? Ate a bowl of chili. Oh, he ate a pizza. Paul, no wonder. He didn't agree with him. And didn't agree with him. He thought, was it the chili? What's going on? He started hurting in his middle. And uh, he was in a lot of pain, extreme pain. And he had already, a few days before, gone to the doctor and said, you know, you know, he was going to be traveling to Australia. He said, if you go to Australia, you're going to die. That happened then, too? Yeah. Because, there, because that happened again. Yeah, that's well, I'm as far as the timing of going to Australia, because I didn't go with him on that trip to Australia, um, but he was told, and I was going through my notes, um, that if you go, you're going to die. And so, um, he gets real ill, we, got, we take him, we, we ride him down in his pacer down to the uh, Rockingham General Hospital, mm -hmm. and they admit him for exploratory surgery. And it was supposed to only be two or three hours. He was in surgery eight hours. And um, when they wheeled him out, he looked gray. He looked like he was dead. And uh, found out from the doctors later, his heart had stopped three times and, time and they revived him because they had cut one of the uh, large arteries next to the pancreas and he had almost bled to death. Um, so Paul, stayed in the hospital and ended up going to Charlottesville and he was there three months in the Charlottesville hospital and I stayed in a trailer with a friend. Um, I was there every day at 8 o'clock, left every night at 10 o'clock, seven days a week for three months. And Paul was being fed through um, a big tube right directly into his heart. Um, and. Um, it's how Paul went through 40 days without food. <laughs> he did, he was kind of a forced fast. You know, they fed him, but he was not able to eat. After about 40 days, you know, Paul would actually dream of eating. He seemed to, he loved cheeseburgers. He'd chew an imaginary cheeseburger at night. Um, um, one, one day he said, David, I got to tell you, uh, Gandhi was here and was in the corner of his room and he was talking to Gandhi. Um, I guess because he was going through this you know, fast, 40 day fast. You know, how did you do it, Gandhi? You know? um, one time, and I, you know, we can cut this out on tape, I don't know, but I got to tell you the story. No, no, it's all right. I mean, I guess for posterity, maybe they'll think it's funny. But Paul had me go out and sneak, sneak a milkshake in. <laughs> Yeah. You know, and they had a tube up his nose into his tummy, pulling out any fluids out of his tummy to keep his pancreas from reacting. The whole idea was to get it to not react. So I sneak him this milkshake, and you see, he, he, he sucked it in, and you see it come right out immediately into this little thing on the side. It was hilarious. <laughs> he just wanted to get the taste of that milkshake. He only did it once or twice, but. I did it got a candy bar. Oh, did you? <laughs> and it would come right back out, right? My mother even went to see him. Yeah. On the way to her mom. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was, that was three months. It went by fast. But when <clears throat> Paul finally went home after three months, and um, I remember, um, and I, I really can't remember if this was during this time or before. Before he went into the hospital in 94, I can't remember, because I remember losing Jennifer. I was in love with Jennifer Stroman at the time, and uh, definitely wanted to marry her. She was the love of my life at that time, and, and you know, I was in the you know, student-teacher relationship with Paul, and I remember Paul saying, you know, I think I've, I've done what I needed to do, I'm leaving. And he was just sitting up in bed in a lotus position and legs crossed and he was serious. He was going to leave. Stephen was there. I was there. And, um, you know, he's just going to exit the body like he does in a reading. And I remember um, 
I said, Paul, you can't leave. I mean, Jennifer just left today and you're leaving and the two people I love most in my life are leaving me. And uh, Paul said he went out of his body and he was looking down and saw me crying at his feet and he came back. Yeah. But, you know, Paul felt, you know, when he had his, when he was on the operation table and he saw, um, he was in a room, a white, a room that was lit white. And he asked God, you know, what should I do? You know? And God asked him, what, you know, you need to make a decision. And Paul said, I can't decide. You decide. That's not what God wants to hear. God wants you to make a decision. It's important to make a decision. And uh, so this, God said to him, we're going to put you on hold. So when Paul came out of that surgery, you know, he was in intensive care, he, all, all the people, the physical bodies, he could see right through them. They didn't look like physical people, they looked like angels. And it took him several days before he kind of got human again and could see their physical bodies. But this being put on hold was kind of what happened with Paul because when he went home after Charlottesville and he came home, you could tell he, he was weak. His voice was weak. Um, that spark, that sharpness was almost gone out of his eyes. It was like he wasn't sure he wanted to be here. And he struggled with that for a couple of years. You know, we did the gardens. Um, you know, every teacher, it doesn't matter whether you're a prophet, they they go through their own stuff. They're not perfect. You know, I think sometimes people expected Paul to be perfect. And, you know, he, he was one of the most loving people I'd ever known. I'd never, ever seen Paul ever get angry. Not once. Never lose his anger. He would get mad, but he wouldn't yell at somebody. Um, I can tell you a number of times that I pissed Paul off. And... Um, but, um, yeah, those two, three years afterward were tough. And he, he went through a lot. And so did I. And so did Thomas. And so did Stephen. We all did. It was tough. Because he, he had to decide if he was going to come back, it was going to be on another level. And he wasn't sure that he wanted to go to that extra level. That's why he was trying to decide, should I leave or, or should I go? So 1987 came around and Paul decided to live because he married Sharon Solomon. We had a huge wedding, it was kind of the launch. Paul's coming back, you know, he's back. Now that doesn't mean we didn't do workshops, but you could tell. Um, I was Paul's nurse, I basically, you know, during that time, the three year period, I gave him his insulin shots, you know, a little pinch belly and you give him an insulin. I did that twice a day. Um, tested his blood, see where it was at, um, tried to put him on a diet, mm -hmm. um, which he did for a time. Um, we had a grand wedding with Sharon Solomon and um, uh, Paul was in his black kimono that he'd gotten from Japan and Sharon had a, a silk kimono from J wedding kimono. wedding kimono from and Japan. Not for, not, for the wedding, what, not for the wedding, afterwards. Yeah. yeah, because our parents, we decided our parents wouldn't really appreciate it. That's right. Yeah, that's because right. His parents were Baptist. And my yes. Parents were Jewish. <laughs> the Japanese outfits were not exactly. Yeah, Sharon had Jewish parents, and Paul had Baptist parents, and the two should never meet, right? <laughs> but they got along. Great. But they got along well. Well, there's beautiful pictures of you all in the yeah. Japanese outfits right. yeah, out so. by the garden. Yeah. And, yeah. And, you know, before the wedding. Yeah. Paul, Paul and I had fluff. <laughs> yeah. Paul had struggled because he, he, with the marriage idea, because 
he was committed to being a teacher with students, and it's hard to have students when you're married. It's just very difficult, if not impossible. Um, and so when he decided, I, I think he came to a conclusion that maybe this is a different direction I'm taking, and marrying Sharon was part of that new direction. I took it as a cue, it was time for David to get married. <laughs> so the very next year I got married. <laughs> um, to Emiko. Um, Emiko was a uh, student, apprentice of Tomasa, who was a Buddhist priestess in Japan. And, um, you know, we mentioned a, a Japanese setting because we had people coming from Japan, and Emiko was the translator for those Japanese. They, they, every word had to be translated in those classes. Can you imagine the burden on her for 40 days? Every class had to be translated. And so, you know, all the Japanese learned Tai Chi and I got to know Emmy and, you know, Paul and I started talking, you know. We looked at a couple candidates, I won't say whom. It was like I was matchmaker for Paul. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it became between Emmy and another girl and, you know, Emmy, Paul said, you know, she's Thomas' son, you know, Paul, students, should marry. Emiko was 15 years older than me. Um, I was 28 years young. Um, I never really had dated in my life. Um, and Emiko told me that she could not have kids up front. And I said, I wasn't planning on having kids. So uh, we went to Japan. Paul was there. Mark Davidson was there. Um, we got married in a grand wedding at Tamasan's temple in Kamakura. And um, I was in a kimono. Of course, Emiko was in a kimono. And uh, so we got married, and Paul went back home. Of course, we did some readings while we were there. I, I did, um, over those two, three years in Japan, I conducted nearly 300 readings. Um, transcribed them as well. Is that and, where that video is from? Yes, online, yeah, from Japan. We went on national television, three major television stations in Japan. Everywhere we went on the subways, people go look at him. You know, they know him. You know, we were easy to spot. Long, blonde-haired kid, you know, prophet-looking guy. You know, you just didn't see that in Japan. Um, and, you know, predicting Mount Fuji erupting and all these things. Um, you know, the Japanese are very interesting people. They... They are the most humble, loving, wonderful people. Uh, Sharon visits there regularly. Uh, once a year, you go? Well, not so much anymore. Not so much anymore, but she did. Um, we had, um, so we got married, and uh, Paul went back, and I stayed in Japan uh, learning more bonsai from Mr. Takanahashi. Amiko did all the translating. He didn't know a stitch of English. And studied Tai Chi, taught English, and um, uh, spent some time there in Japan. It was a wonderful time. Lived at Thomason's temple. And that's another story. You know, Paul and Thomason used to talk together. One particular story, uh, Paul sent a brass cross, uh, similar to this type of cross, but it was a crucifix, actually, with Jesus on the crucifix. And uh, I brought it in, you know, really, you know, because I knew Thomas someone would put it on her altar. And I took the cross out of the bag and Thomas on screamed. I mean, she's, I never heard her scream, but she's always chanting and talking. She loved to talk and Emmy would translate and she screamed. And I thought, what happened? And she ran out of the room. And Emmy chased her. I, I was in shock. I, I, completely opposite of what I expected. So um, she, she finally, uh, thomas -san came back and she calmed down and she took the cross and we laid it over and she asked Emiko to ask me to unscrew the screws and she took the brass crucifix of Jesus, you know, Jesus crucified on the cross and took him and held him, her, him in his hand, her hands and to her heart she was in tears. 
and she stood Jesus up and she told the woman, he's living. He's not dead. And um, so she carefully, we took the cross ceremoniously into the altar room and put the cross there next to Buddha and stood Jesus up, you know, put a little block of wood behind him because he wouldn't stand up otherwise. <laughs> and she sang chants for like an hour and then everything was okay. But that was really cool. That was a really cool story. Um, Paul and Thomas on would talk. Paul was still at the time struggling with his pancreas. And um, Thomas son was urging him to eat clean and fresh water, but that's the way Thomas son believed. She died at 94. And even the source used to get on Paul about that way he took care of his body and his health. And so, you know, Michael McCarthy used to talk about it. They'd slap him around. You know, you need to you know, eat right. Maybe it's from those Henry VIII days, who knows? You know, one of the things I've learned from writing the Chronicles is that you die in character and eat from lifetime to lifetime, that character still persists. We learn a little bit, learn a little bit, learn a little bit, but those trends, uh, even the DNA trends, t tend to keep coming. So, um, I saw that, Paul. One thing I want to mention before we go, before I forget, you know, Paul and I loved each other so much. I would get mad at him, he would get mad at me, like any relationship. But you know it's the relationship that teaches. Um, people even sometimes wondered if you know Paul's sexual orientation because we spent so much time together. But I'll tell you, I certainly loved women and Paul did too. Um, but our love, you know, he one time told me, looked into my eyes, and he was sitting in the parsonage in the kitchen and he looked at me he said I have never loved anybody as deeply as I love you David and you know when he died I had never lost anybody close uh, I never lost a family member uh, and I remember when he died, I, I was playing a computer game, some stupid, silly computer game, wasting my time. I was at John Alton's house you know, with Anna, my second wife. And I remember throwing the mouse across the room. I was angry that he left. Uh, You know, after he died, Paul came back to me again, and uh, his face was literally inches from mine. And he told me how much he missed me. And I woke up crying. He was in his um, uh, coat of Joseph colors, you know. He was missing me. But as, you know, the dreams about Paul coming to see me changed. We had one near-death dream, as I call them, when you reach beyond the veil and uh, you can speak with the deceased. And that's been happening a lot for me lately because of my own situation. You know, um, you know, where Paul and I are talking to each other pretty much as peers in my dream. And uh, we were talking about, in one dream, on October 31st of last year, um, Paul came to me. We were at the White House, and literally, it was like the White House. There were exotic paintings all around, and Paul asked if we could have uh, a drink. We had a little granite bar, and we had a little like shot glass of something, I guess afterlife something. And uh, we were talking about, you know, how profits are made. And how to make a profit, you have to unify the mind. To create the Shekinah light, the halo that sits over the head where, you know, like the apostles' pictures are taken. And I said, 
you know, you, you can only train a student to a certain point. God chooses the prophet. That's what I told Paul. I'm sitting there telling Paul this in the dream. And he was just listening to me. And, uh, you know, I, recently, you know, he's shown up. When Dr. Mary Hensley came on August 10th to speak, she had actually hugged Paul the day before at the AORE and didn't know it was him. He was some nice gentleman. And then when she came in the foyer, saw Paul's picture and said, oh, I know him. I met him yesterday. She said that. She said that. And, uh, and everybody went, whoa, because when Mary came in, she talked to me and I talked to her and said, yeah, I'm David Solomon. Paul's adopted son. I said, yeah, I just met your dad. And he's here, and uh, he's, he thanked me yesterday for my talk at the ARE, and he's come basically to listen. So, uh, so yeah, Paul's hanging around now. I think he's actively um, participating in a lot of things, and I wouldn't surprise if, you know, uh, Susan just had a dream last night about Paul. So I think he's actively showing up and wants to, you know, we're, we're at a very, I think, crucial time in our development and that we're starting to grow again. Let me see. Let's see. Between, we were in Japan. Oh, we had a reading one time in Japan where during the reading, Paul was describing a past life of a Japanese person who was a kahuna and how they used to call lightning down from the skies and uh, touch someone and bring them back to life, start the heart or something like that, or someone who had died and like resurrected them from the dead. And as soon as he said that, a bolt of lightning went boom right outside. There had been no thunderstorms. There was, it was lightly raining. But boom, the lightning hit right after he said that, like literally seconds. And that was the only lightning bolt of the day. That was pretty cool. Made everybody jump. <laughs> Emiko jumped. She was in. But um, stuff like that happened around Paul. Um, you know, the supernatural things we want to look for in a teacher, a prophet, you know, those are not the things that teach. They're not. Um, like I said, if you look at the students and those hung around Paul, you'd see they're extraordinary. Delin noticed it. She said, everybody that was with Paul, they're extraordinary. Mary Elizabeth, Stephen Haslam, Rob Pennington, Sharon. Um, they're extraordinary people. Uh, and many more that I'm not naming. Susan, Sarah, and some of them are, are scattered around the world. Susie Holbeach, who's not here, or not here physically with us. I really like Susie. And that brings up a memory, because sometimes I need to get stimulated on remembering things. Um, we were at a family gathering in England, and uh, Susie and her husband, Paul and I, were going to go eat lunch. And we took a little rental car that, what was Susie's husband's name? Do you remember? Uh, if you remember, just call it out. Um, we're going out to lunch. Um, and it was just like half a mile down the road from where the retreat was. We got in the car. No one had their seatbelts on. And, you know, we're just going half a mile down the road. You know, there's no ding, ding, ding like we have today. You know, we just got in, went. Susie was to the right of me on the back seat. You know, of course... Um, the steering wheel's on the right side, Paul's on the left. So anyway, we come around this corner and there was a Volvo there and we hit head on. Yeah, we hit head on. Head on. We are only going about 25 or 35. I, it wasn't fast, but it was fast enough. You know, we both slammed the brakes and boom, you know. I hit the seat in front of me and bounced back because none of us had seat belts on. Paul put his hand out and fractured his hand. Susie's whole beach who always had bright orange-red lipstick. I called, she was called Plastic Lips because she always had this bright lipstick. Her mouth went like this and she left an imprint on the seat. You know, and, uh, but I looked next to me and she was unconscious. 
for about 30 seconds and she was bleeding, blood was coming down her neck. Her earring had torn, you know, a gash in her backside of her skull. The guy that hit us, he had a Volvo, his car was hardly damaged, our car was totaled. And um, so we got out, everybody was generally okay, Susie came up, what happened? Um, we didn't go eat lunch, as you can imagine. And we took uh, Susie and everybody went back to the retreat and Paul actually found a suture and stitched, stitched up her wound, her gash. I didn't know he could do that. I guess he learned that in the army. You know, he was, uh, he learned some medicine in the army and he stitched, stitched it up. But one of the reasons I tell that story is because Paul had wanted to get a collage of the fellowship gathering because every year he'd always had a collage of the gathering, something we probably should do again because you know, if we could find all the pictures. And um, Paul asked me, it was Sunday night, the gathering ended at noon on Wednesday and we were in England. So he, so he says, I want to get pictures to do a collage. And I said, Paul, that's not going to happen. I mean, even if they send it out Monday morning, we wouldn't get it until Wednesday. At the, at the earliest, it wouldn't even get through customs. And I said, I want it done anyway. I said, I don't. See, this is where a student, it's the old um, uh, Annabelle, uh, what's the story? When she ended up, Annabelle Sant story, where she ended up standing up to her teacher and said, no. know that I'm busy. Um, she's probably checking up on me. Uh, I'm out alone. I hardly even get to drive the car anymore. Um, and I said, no, I'm not going to do it. And Paul got angry. One of the few times I'd ever seen him angry. And uh, he got so angry that I said, I'm done. I'm going home. And um, I think Sharon relates that later Paul cried oh, over that incident. That. Yeah. yeah. How much he loved you. Yeah, it was, you know, it was a, you know, we had a head on collision that day, and literally that afternoon we had a head on collision spiritually. I mean, it really was. That had never happened before. And I left. I went to. London and did a talk show about earth changes on my way home and I left. I went to John Alton after that. I started talking with Paul Edward and I, I left. I was like, and that's what happens though. You know, it doesn't mean Paul was bad or I was bad. It just, I needed to be, I needed to find a way out of the nest. And um, that's what happened. So anyway, so Paul comes home without David, and he, um, I don't remember whether it was the day after he got home yeah. or a couple of days, but um, usually David and Paul would go for a walk in the garden. Yeah. Um, but, and because I wasn't, I wasn't really interested in the garden, so he never <laughs> took me. <laughs> and I realize now that how I could have gotten to go for a walk in the garden, but he, so, David wasn't there, so I got to go for a walk in the garden with him. And I just started crying. And he started talking about David's not here and um, that this split had happened. And I said, well, let's call him and come, come home. Yeah. And Paul said, no, no, no. And, uh, mm -hmm. But he's crying. And the next day, we went out for a walk again, and he was crying again. So I called David and told him to come home. but. Um, he told me it was I did a terrible thing. I shouldn't have called, and you told me I shouldn't have called. But they came. David came back and hugged him, and they were all right for a yeah. while. It was the beginning was, of weaning they, weaning yeah. away from each other at the time. But I wanted to also talk about Paul would always get these ideas of doing these impossible projects, right. and we would all know it was absolutely impossible to get this, this, and this done. And Paul would insist it he is says, possible. Yeah. yeah, and I just remember um, so many times, you know, we'd, we'd decide we'd all go into the office and we would tell him how impossible it was and we couldn't do it. And for me, 
I'd write down my list of questions and all my things about how it was impossible. And I would go and I would sit in front of him and he would be talking about this project and I would say, oh, of course I can do it. No problem. <laughs> I would just get into his energy and I would know that there was absolutely nothing that was going to be impossible. And I would look at my questions no, that's not a question. I know the answer to that. I know the answer to that. Yeah. No question. And then I'd get out and I'd start trying to do it. And then it was impossible. Right. <laughs> but a lot of times those impossible things got done because he just had a different relationship with time and space and energy that when he decided something was going to get done, it got done. He was a train. I mean, that's a lot of folks, yeah, students himself, ask, you know. Right. You know, what's, what's the secret? You know, Paul just didn't stop. He worked to three and four in the morning almost every night. Slept till noon, but he worked late. Um, he, he just, he was a train. He just never stopped. Well, he said that he got, he uh, built a self image yeah. of, um, you know, people build self images of themselves, but he saw himself as a train. And anything that he wanted to get done would be accomplished. He, there was no limit. There yeah. was absolutely no limit to what he could accomplish. Well, and that's why he wrote the book, The Metahuman, um, which was about you know the the abilities that we have that we don't know we have. We, as as we all know, we only use five to eight percent of our brains. And you know the part of the idea of the School of Prophets, and that we might as well talk about that. It's and it's almost nine o'clock, and I'll probably you know we're we're getting close. Everybody's getting tired. Um, the School of Prophets, you know, was always an idea talked about by, by the source from the earliest readings. That, and again, we should remember, and I have come to believe in this, and of course Sharon was shocked when I found out, when she found out about my cancer, which was terminal, considered terminal. You know, the School of Prophets, I think the source commanded that it should be built. It's not necessarily in one place, not necessarily in one time. And we are building it right now, whether it manifests in Brooks Garden and manifested for a time at Hearthfire Lodge in Carmel in the Valley. It's an ongoing project and, it, and I think it comes in stages. You know, I had a, a dream where I was uh, shot in the head in 1980 and uh, it was shot in the place where my tumor is now. And in the dream, I dreamed that I would die a, pain, a painless death, which is what happens with these kind of tumors, and that I would come back during or right after the earth changes to be part of that school. So if I'm on, a, I'm on, if I'm in on time scheduling, it would make sense that, you know, usually in the afterlife, you take 20 or 30 years off and you come back. It's pretty consistent like that, within 50 years typically, if not a lot sooner. So, um, so those younger of us in the family, watch out. <laughs> um, but that school of prophets was to attract teachers from all over the world, you know, apostles, of the old. Um, Stories about John Peniel, the case he spoke of, the source spoke of, um, in preparation for a new day. And the, that new day is a new heaven and new earth. It doesn't happen until there is a new heaven. And that means new star alignments. A new earth means a new earth. And there's, there is an event that triggers that. Source talked about it a lot. They talked about the light that's coming. They described it as a spaceship, but as a light, probably more of a comet. And that's what causes the change. And until that happens, the earth doesn't change, mountains don't rise and fall, and the stars don't change position. But that's what triggers it. All of Casey's prophecies, all of Paul's prophecies that talk about it are triggered by this event. And in a reading Paul gave to me, that's exactly what he said. Now, whether that happens in the next 10 years or 20 years or 30 years, 
I think it's likely, actually. No later than 2079. Why? Because the Muslim prophecies also say so. You know, I call the Islamic people the people of the stars because most of the star names we have today are Arabic. Um, I think Muhammad was a prophet. He was a lot like Paul, actually. Um, indifferent, in a way. He was a commander-in-chief. He was... Um, he had unusual experiences that could be very similar to what Casey and Paul had experienced. Not going in under hypnosis, but having experiences where archangels would come and, and talk to him. And he would pass the message along. And he had to learn over 21 years what a, about taking the message, but he also struggled with... Um, killing people. I mean, David went through the same thing. So did Moses. So did Joshua. All of those patriarchs killed people. So, Paul, going back to Paul, and the school of prophets, it will happen. I think, um, and Sharon, who's, you know, with Mark Davidson, who are part of St. Luke's Retreat, are building that. And those of you who can um, choose to go there and visit there, and I plan to take my son there so he knows there's, there's a retreat to go to, um, my son Benjamin um, and Angela, um, that, that place is ordained, I think preordained. And those of you listening to this hear that. It is one of the most quiet, peaceful re retreats that I've ever seen, and it's, it is an hour and a half from nowhere. And um, in fact, World War III could happen, and they would get the news a week later. It's, um, I had, uh, you know, <laughs> experiencing, you know, just looking back at some things. I had to, you know, we did fire walking. We had a class with Tolly Birkin. Barkin, Birkin, and uh, we, you know, 50 of us went to, you know, 50 of us, several of us, a dozen of us went to um, a fire walking retreat, and there must have been 100 people there. Stephen was among those. Did you go, Sharon? Yeah, you went. You were there, Susan. And uh, do you remember when they raked the coals after burning the big bonfire? It ended up being right in front of me. I mean, there were 100 people, and it's right in front of me, and, you know, if you've never walked on fire before, and most, I don't think anybody had, but anyway, it was like, of course, I've got to go first. So uh, I put Jesus on the other side of the coals, and I walked across, and it felt like warm, warm uh, cornflakes is what it felt like. Sprayed off my feet. I mean, it must have been 25 feet of coals, I and mean, it was a long was fire a long walk. One. It was a long one. It was um, still easier than regular life, but anyway. Yeah. <laughs> You know, some people went again and again. I said, once is enough. Um, you know what was even scarier? Paul tried to have us do things that were, you know, overcome our fears, like cleaning spiders, walking on fire. Um, the, um, in Japan, we went through a water purification exercise where we went up to the mountains. I went with Emiko. Paul wasn't there. And we went to a hot house where they had hot tubs and but we had to walk a half mile to the waterfall, which was in the middle of winter, below freezing, snow on the ground, and we had to wear underwear only. Sit on a rock, put our heads together, and pray for five minutes while we were doused with water that would create hypothermia. You know, the Buddhists did it as a purification exercise. So Emmy said, you gotta do it, this is like great. And you know, ever since I grew up, I hated cold water. I, I won't get into water less than 82 degrees. <laughs> so I'm going to this cold, I said, you gotta be kidding me, water's 37 degrees. So we walked there in our white robes, uh, tennis shoes, white robes, underwear. We get there and one by one, 
one by one, we uh, walk into, uh, you know, get under the waterfall, sit on this rock, and we sing in a prayer. And, you know, I'm sure the Buddhists were singing their Buddhist prayer, and I'm going, oh my God, this is cold. Oh, I'm going to die. Why am I doing this? Am I nuts? This isn't spiritual. What are those people thinking? <sighs> After about a minute, you know, your, your body gets so numb from the cold water that you start feeling warm almost. And I'm sitting there and I'm going, when is five minutes over going to be over? Oh, God, please. <sighs> At least if it's going to wash some of the bad stuff out of me, do it. But <laughs> so, uh, uh, um, you know, they make it all look spiritual on TV, but the real life stuff is sometimes different. <sighs> so I get out of the water, walk in, you know, in knee deep water, and I go to get my robe on, and I'm thank, thank God. And he asked me as I went by, do you want to go back? No. Nope. That's okay. No, I said, it's okay. That's kind of what I said. That's okay. <laughs> so. <sighs> I, I get my, my tennis shoes are waiting there, right? And I'm stepping into my tennis shoes and I get one shoe on. I should have been better balanced knowing Tai Chi. Um, and I step in the other shoe and I lost my footing. I stepped back with both my shoes into the cold water. So both my tennis shoes got soaked with that ice cold water, right? I mean, things would have been fine walking back. You would have felt kind of warm from getting the water. You're getting a warm robe on. But I had these cold, below freezing temperatures uh, outside, and I'm walking back and I'm going, this is worse than the waterfall. I'm, I was like, it suffer I was in pain, it was it hurt, it was an agony. And I'm walking back and going, this is not spiritual. I will never do this. This is like awful. And I'm talking, you know, the self-talk thing. I'm talking to myself and I'm going, oh God, when will we get back? Because there's a hot tub there and we got dinner waiting and I get back. And so I get in, you know, I finally get my feet warmed up in the hot tub, and they, and Emiko says, David san, you want to go back in the morning? <laughs> so I, I, you know, I, I, I said, I'll think about it. <laughs> and all night I dreamed about bees stinging me. I literally did. It was like, you know, fear. That's a fear. Bees were fear. I was afraid. And I ended up not going. And, um, and I really feel bad about that to this day. You know, the lessons, and it's all about overcoming your fear um, and not being afraid and, and, and choosing love instead of fear. And, you know, as, as students, you know, the lessons are ongoing all the time. Heck, this afternoon I was, you know, I was in a piece, John Anthony West sent a piece, I have this chapter called Rice Paper Teachers, and I'm writing about, John says, you mentioned about learning the greater mysteries, well, which ones haven't you learned yet? So I write down, you know, he says, make a list of what you haven't learned yet. And uh, the Lynn comes in and said, you know, your son did a crappy job on the bathroom, and I'm pissed. And you need to learn to communicate with your children, and hold them accountable. And I had all this stuff going on. I, I mean, I have things coming up left and right, and I took the remote control and I threw it down the bed and I said, what do you expect me to do? As I'm looking at my list of lessons on the piece of paper, and I noticed that communication wasn't on there. <laughs> Literally, at that second, as I'm listing the lessons, uh, and I wrote an embarrassingly long list. You know, <laughs> you, know um, you know, studying under a teacher, and I literally threw my classes actually on the bed. Oh. I threw them again. These are like seven dollar pair of classes. These are not expensive classes. Um, you know, once you, you know, Paul taught. Once you start becoming conscious of the mystery school. I literally, literally, if you start keeping a journal within 24 hours, stuff will happen that shows God's aware that you just began a journal. And he used to teach that and, you know, until the student has experience of seeing these things happen over and over again to the point where it's almost scary. Not scary and fearful scary, but just like, this is getting really strange. You know, like we're being watched constantly, and we are. And we're being tested constantly, and we are, you know. Um, one of my lessons, you know, I wrote down my explosive anger. Um, you know, I can be peaceful for long periods of time and then something gets me and I go, Arr! 
And then I'm calm minutes later. You know, and I keep saying, God, Lord, I would really like to get this one done. And boom, that situation comes up with my kids. And uh, holding kids accountable, holding people accountable, holding other adults accountable, holding employees accountable. That's a tough one. So all the lessons, all the greater mysteries Paul is teaching me, you know, learning to listen, learning to pay attention, learning to be present. Um, they're ongoing. They never stop. You just keep being reminded of them. Keep a journal. Some of you are going to write a book in 20 years. Keep a journal. Write the dates down in your dreams. Keep a journal. You're never going to know when anniversaries hit those dates that you had dreams. It happens a lot. Um, you know, Paul dying 10 years in a day. Uh, we saw that a lot in the, in the studies of the saints. You know, 10 years, you get an extension on your appointed time, a new lease on life. It tends to be 10 year increments, actually. So, um, Any other stories you can remember? Yeah, I'm tired. Yeah, I think we're about done. That's about it. You know, we could talk about more things, but sometimes you don't remember them until people stimulate and they go, oh, that story, that's cool. So. I want to do, when I come back in July, maybe you could do, talk about the prophecy readings. Yeah, the prophecy readings, yeah, absolutely. Love to do that. That was uh, one of my favorite areas, and it still is my favorite area, so yes. Thank you. Thank you for your time.